So I hope that you are ready to see some exciting work from this team as we welcome Andrew and Bill to the stage. Thank you. Hello, I'm Bill Bennett, and this is my uh, friend Andrew Sinegra, who is kind enough to hire me to shoot a couple car spots uh, in this past year. And we'll start right off by showing you the spots to start with, and then we'll discuss what we did. When we were having the initial discussions of the spot, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first one, in the discussion, because they were going to do so much work to these pieces, that he says, we need to shoot this work with prime lenses so that I can know what the focal length is at any given moment. Andrew runs uh, is a director, but he's also a post-production supervisor at a company called Entropic that was hired to make these two spots, one for Lincoln and one for Ford. We. I knew, that being hired to, do, to shoot the piece, that the Alexa has capability that's called metadata, and what's it good for? Well, Andrew knew that we were going to go to this amazing place that happens to be in Valencia, Spain, to shoot these car commercials, and I'll, talk to, I'll let him talk a little bit about why this place was chosen and his, his thinking behind uh, shooting the cars there. So basically, when the art director uh, from the ad agency at Team Detroit came to us, they wanted something that was surreal and magical. And at one point they came to us and were like, let's do it all in CG. And to be honest, even though I came from a post background originally, that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I love going out and filming, getting the real textures and environments, backgrounds, and actually creating, there's things that you find on set that you, you just don't in a computer. So I said, okay, well, where can we find these surreal locations that have the look and feel that you want, but actually go and film these in, in a practical location? So literally looked all over the globe and came up with the City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia, Spain. Oops. This. And this um, is a place yeah. that really exists. Yeah, so this was, uh, this was built, uh, the architect's uh, name was Calatrava, and he built this entire location. It's all very stark white. The, the place actually works on a large scale. It's city blocks long. Um, you can see for you know clear like mile, mile and a half, all the way down through the entire plaza. And it just had these perfect uh, runways to kind of display the car and this very graphical architecture that we could actually place the car in. Uh, that center, uh, the building that you see on the left is called the Eye. And basically there was an IMAX theater in the center of the dome. But just being inside there and actually driving the car around there was just an incredibly surreal experience. So we knew, we went to the agency and said, look, we got to go here, we got to shoot this. And they said, how do you make that happen? Well, there was, a, there was a particular problem for both of these car spots in that the, at the time that we shot this, the car didn't exist. So the solution we did was we shot a stand-in car with tracking mounts and shot the car in a conventional manner, meaning I would find the proper locations that Andrew liked, we would decide when the light was correct, and then through the use of the metadata system, we were controlling the camera with the wireless remote system, and the metadata system in Plus and Studio cameras has the capability of recording metadata into the ProRes files, which were used for editorial, and ARIRAW files, but you can also record them into DNX HD, and it's streamed live into any HDI, HDSDI output. Uh, it includes a lot of information about what's happening with the camera at any given moment, including pitch and roll, and then as far as what the, what the lens is uh, doing at any given moment, it solved my problem with him needing to know what the focal length was, because frame by frame it tells him what the focal length was at any given moment, even though I'm zooming during the shot. It tells him what the focus distance is. It also tells him the T-stop, and then if we're changing lenses in the metadata is the name of the lens by serial number, because he characterizes the lenses and then uses them later uh, to create a CG car that sits on top of that. And I'll let him describe a little bit about how that's done. 
Well, basically, you know, we go through and, and uh, using the Airy Meta Extract, we extract all of the data and we end up with these spreadsheets of lens information. Uh, through there, we're getting, you know, focal length, f-stop, tilt, roll, um, pretty much everything you need to basically set up and know what the orientation of your camera wants to be. I mean, typically the way we typically wor we would work is that we would go in, we'd just send it to the tracking, uh, tracking information, give it a, here's a starting focal length, give me your best guess of what we got. Here, I can actually go through on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, keyframe out the focal lengths. It, it gets an infinitely better result when we're actually putting in proper lens data that we know is accurate down to the hundredths of a millimeter on focal length. So it, it's just that much more level of complexity of things, moves that, if Bill had told me, okay, I wanna be driving car to car, you know, on a, you know, on an arm that's extending, wall zooming and swinging around the front of a vehicle, I'd have been like, uh, it's gonna take me forever, I'm not gonna do it. You gotta understand that each line in the spreadsheet that's extracted from metadata, that's one frame. So that's the focus distance, this is the focal length, this is the actual lens by number, the T-stop, and then this is the amount of tilt and roll in the camera at that moment in that frame, which then he used to match the virtual camera in his virtual world to where the real camera was in the real world, and then laid the car on top of that, which in my opinion is phenomenal. The other thing that's really important is we had another camera that would drive through immediately after we went through with the stand-in car and the camera car and the arm that was looking straight up with a fisheye lens that created this hemisphere and recorded the actual lighting that was there at that given instant, or actually a few moments later. We would drive through and record this so that uh, Andrew will explain how he would use that. Uh, basically, we would capture this, this information and you, since it drove down the exact same path that the hero vehicle drove, I have a perfect reflection dome for what I need to put back in, especially when we're going by uh, near architecture and uh, just, you know, any of the outside environments, driving on the bridge where we had the sun, it was all in the proper spatial location. And I used that, extracted that back out and create uh, lat long maps that I used as reflections, HDR reflections that I put back on our CG vehicles. So, our reflections matched 100% to what was actually shot on the day. There is uh, one thing that I skipped past in that if you use a lens that has built-in LDS, which there are some zooms that do, it's all automatic. The camera knows which lens it is, it knows the focal length, knows the focus distance, knows the T-stop. But there's a whole world of zoom lenses out there that do not have that. So there's a tool that actually resides in every single Alexa, and there's an ethernet connector on the back of every Alexa. You connect any laptop, or actually any computer, that can run a browser and communicate through ethernet, and you find that there's a built-in web page inside every Alexa that one of the things that it can do is lens data archive, and you, in about 10 minutes, tell the system where each F focus distance is, and where every f-stop is, and where all the zoom focal length positions are. And then once you do that, you save it as a file and put it back into the camera. And then once you've done that, it always stays in there. And then when you're changing lenses, you just quickly select out of a, a list uh, which lens this is, and then based upon where the motors, which are connected into the side of the camera, where they're positioned after you calibrate, then the system knows what focal length is. So it can work with virtually any zoom lens or any non-LDS lens. Um, so why don't we show them the spot again, and then it's actually a slightly different edit, and then we have a version where there's a little bit of the behind the scenes uh, material as well. I mean, one of the greatest things about this is we're literally, you know, Bill and I are in the car, and I'm yelling, you know, let's go over here, let's go over there, you know, and, and we're, we're getting a lot of this stuff on the fly. If, I feel bad for the script it's supervisor that was trying to keep up with us on this. So just the fact that all of the lens information was being captured, um, you know, as we went, it, it just, it enabled us to capture quicker and move faster and work quicker. And the beauty of shooting a stand-in car is all the dynamics, which are actually mistakes of the jiggling of the car body and the camera, get captured back into the material that he is laying the car on top of. Here you see the various layers that he was creating. Yeah, I mean, and that's... for a moment there, you saw the stand-in car. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that, I mean, I think we, we kind of pride ourselves on, on our technique is 
don't over clean the plates. I mean, that, that's kind of a dead giveaway that it's going to end up looking CG. I mean, the, the, the environment itself, even though it's practical, almost looks artificial just because of the nature of, of how it films. But if, if we overstabilized everything, if we overstabilized the car, if we tried to clean it up too much, you lose the gritty realness that is the, is the benefit of actually filming in real life. You know, and then, and then on top of that, there's a lot of work that we do on the CGN to actually, you know, match the texture of uh, orange peel in the paint and the swirls and the clear coat and things like that. The the chromation, chromatic aberration that you have in uh, anti-glare films that go in the headlights. I mean, so there's a lot of work on the post side to make it come to life. So, bottom line is a, a technology that Aerie builds into virtually every Aerie Alexa is now enabling this sort of activity, and Andrew told me that it saved him hours and hours of matching the shots that we did. Like he said, if we were just flying around the car randomly with this camera car waving this camera about and me randomly zooming, and he had no idea of where the zoom lens was at any given moment, it would have taken him far longer just to get to the point where he could start to lay the CG car on top of the stand-in car. Yeah, I mean, just from a workflow, the agency just really loved it because by the time we've actually shot a real car and not just background plates, they can take an edit that actually has a car in it to the client and say, here's what your spot's gonna look like, only it's gonna be your car in it. The client's gonna willing to buy off on it, so when I go into tracking, I'm knowing this stuff's not gonna get kicked back because the angle on the car is wrong. Oh, that, actually, that's huge because then by the time that you get to the point where you're doing your frame-by-frame -frame work, yeah. you know this is the edit. Oh, by the time we lock the edit, I mean, and we've also developed a good relationship with, with them over the years, but basically it's just, okay, go, put our car in there and make it look good. There is no iteration because they already know the dynamics of the car, they know how it's filmed, they know exactly what the edit's gonna look like. So it's all bought off on, then honestly they leave us alone until it's done, which awesome. is nice.